The Wanderer by Sharon Creech Illustrated by Pepe Botella So the story of The Wanderer is that the main character, Sophie, was in a boating accident with her parents as a young kid. They died. She survived and was eventually, at age 10, adopted. Now she's going on a trip across the Atlantic with her three adoptive uncles and two cousins. The cousins know she's adopted, but Sophie is weirdly in denial about it and talks about her adoptive parents and grandfather Bompy as though she's known them her whole life. This puzzles her cousins. What really happened is sort of a mystery that unfolds over the course of the novel. Three Sides Sophie I am not always such a dreamy girl listening to the sea calling me. My father calls me three-sided Sophie. One side is dreamy and romantic, one is logical and down-to-earth, and the third side is hard-headed and impulsive. He says I am either in dreamland or earthland or mule land, and if I ever get the three together, I'll be all set, though I wonder where I will be then. If I am not in dreamland or earthland or mule land, where will I be? My father says my logical side is most like him, and the dreamy side most like my mother, which isn't entirely fair, I don't think. My father likes to think of himself as a logical man, but he is the one who pours over pictures of exotic lands and says things like, we should go on a safari, and we should zip through the air in a hot air balloon. And although my mother is a weaver and spins silky cloths and wears flowing dresses, she is the one who gives me sailing textbooks and makes me study water safety and weather prediction and says things like, Yes, Sophie, I taught you to sail, but that doesn't mean I like the idea of you being out there alone on the water. I want you to stay home, here, with me, safe. My father says he doesn't know who my hard-headed mule side resembles. He says mules don't run in the family. I am 13 and I am going to sail across the ocean. Although I would like to go alone, 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 flying over the water, I'm not. My mule self begged a place aboard a 45-foot sailboat with a motley crew, three uncles and two cousins. The uncles, Stu, Mo, and Doc, are my mother's brothers, and she told them, if the slightest harm comes to my Sophie, I'll string you all up by your toes. She isn't worried, although maybe she should be, about the influence of my cousin Brian, quiet, studious, serious Brian, but she frets over the bad habits I might learn from my other cousin, Cody. Cody is loud, impulsive, and charming in a way my mother does not trust. He's too charming, she says, in a dangerous sort of way. My mother isn't the only person who is not thrilled for me to take this trip. My uncle Stu and Mo tried their best to talk me out of it. It's going to be a bunch of us guys doing guy things, and it wouldn't be a very pleasant place for a girl. And wouldn't you rather stay home, Sophie, where you could have a shower every day? And it's a lot of hard work. And yakety yak they went. But I was determined to go, and my mule self kicked in, spouting a slew of sailing and weather terms battering them over the head with all the things I'd learned in my sailing books and with some things I'd made up for good measure. Uncle Doc, the good uncle I call him, because he's the one who doesn't see any harm in my coming, said, Heck, she knows more about boats than Brian and Cody put together. And so they caved in. There are two other reasons my mother has not tied me to my bed and refused to let me go. The first is that Uncle Doc gave her an extensive list of the safety provisions aboard the boat, which include a satellite navigator, the global positioning system. The second reason, not a very logical one, but one that somehow comforts my mother, is that Bompy is on the other side of the ocean. We will end up in Bompy's arms, and she wishes she could join us just for that moment. Bompy is my grandfather my mother's father, and also Uncle Doc, Stu, and Moe's father, and he lived with my parents for many years. He is like a third parent, and I love him because he is so like me. 
He is a man of three sides, like me, and he knows what I am thinking without my having to say it. He is a sweet man with a honey tongue, and he is a teller of tales. At the age of seventy-two, Bumpy decided to go home. I thought he was already in his home, but what he meant by home was the place where he was born, and that place was the rolling green hills of England. My father was wrong about mules not running in the family. When Bumpy decided to return to England, nothing was going to stop him. He made up his mind, and that was that, and off he went. Bye, bye, Bumpy. Afloat, Sophie. We have begun. Last night, when we sailed by the stars along the Connecticut coastline on a trial run, I thought my heart would leap out into the sky. Overhead, all was velvety blue black, pierced with pearly stars, and blending into shimmery black ocean. The smell of the sea, the feel of the wind on your face and your arms, the flapping of the sails—oh, it was magic! We are really on the way. The sea is calling, calling, sail on, sail on, and the gentle rocking of the wanderer makes me think of Bombi. Was it Bombi, holding me on his lap when I was young, whispering stories into the air? The first leg of our journey will take us through Long Island Sound to Block Island, and then a short hop onto Martha's Vineyard, a loop around Cape Cod, and up the northern coast, and then onto Nova Scotia, and finally the long stretch to Ireland and to England, land of Bumpy. Uncle Doc estimates that it will take us three to four weeks, depending on how long we stop when we spy land. Cody is keeping a journal too. Only he calls it a dog. When I first heard him say that, I said, "You mean a log?" He said, "No, a dog, a dog log." He said he is keeping this dog log because he has to for a summer project. It was either that or read five books. He said, "I figure it'll be a lot easier keeping a dog log than reading all those words somebody else wrote." Uncle Doc maintains the official captain's log. And in the front of it are neat maps that chart our journey. Uncle Stu and Brian said they'd be too busy to record the highlights. And when I asked Uncle Mo if he was going to keep any sort of record of the trip, he yawned. "Oh," he said, tapping his head. "I'll keep it all in here, and maybe I'll sketch a few things." "You mean draw? You can draw?" "Don't sound so surprised," he said. I was surprised, because it doesn't seem like he has the energy to do much of anything. We all have daily chores from Brian's list and duty watches, and Uncle Stu came up with the idea that each of us has to teach something along the way. Like what? Cody asked. Anything. Navigating by instruments, by stars. Right, Cody said. Easy for you, but what if we don't know any of that stuff? You must know something you could teach us," Uncle Stu said, with a little smirk. "How about juggling?" Cody said. "I could teach you all how to juggle." "Juggle?" Brian said. "Doofus," Cody's father said. "I'd like to learn how to juggle," I said. "I bet it's not as easy as it looks." "What's juggling got to do with anything?" Brian asked. "Well, if you think it'd be too hard for you," Cody said. Who said anything about hard? I could juggle. It just seems a stupid thing to learn on a boat. I'm not sure yet what I could teach, but I'll think of something. We have to decide by tonight. The weather is perfect today. Sunny and warm. The current is with us, and the wind has been gently nudging us toward the hazy cliffs of Block Island. I've been to Block Island before once, but I don't remember who it was with. My parents and grandfather. I remember walking on top of a big hill with lush purple and yellow flowers and scraggly brush growing around the rocks, and I remember the old blue pickup truck with lawn chairs in the back and riding along narrow lanes, staring out at the ocean and singing, "Oh, here we are on the island of Block in a big blue pickup truck." My grandfather bought me a captain's cap, which I wore every day. 
we went clamming at night, and I scouted airplanes in the cottage loft. And every summer after that, I longed to return to Block Island, but we never did. There wasn't time. I thought of something I could teach my boat family. The stories that Bumpy taught me. Doc and Cody have just caught two bluefish. Success! But I didn't like watching Cody club and gut them. We're all going to have to do this, though. It's one of the rules. It's my turn next, and I don't want to do it. But the bluffs of Block Island are in sight, and the bluefish is filleted for lunch, and I am hungry. Slugs and bananas. Cody. My father is driving me bananas. He lies around like a slug and doesn't help with anything and barks orders right and left. Sophie is lucky. She doesn't have any parents to bug her. Uncle Stu said the only reason she's on this trip is because Uncle Doc took pity on the orphan. That's what Uncle Stu calls Sophie, the orphan. I want to slug him when he calls her that. Sophie talks about my aunt and uncle as if they are her real parents, even though they are only her adopted parents and she's only been with them three years. Brian says Sophie lives in a dream world, but I think it's kind of neat that she does that. At least she isn't sitting around moping about being an orphan. Sometimes I wish I were an orphan because my father is a big crab and my mother is afraid of him and always hiding in the corner, looking pitiful. But I guess I'm not supposed to write about stuff like that in this dog log. I guess I'm supposed to write about the journey and all that. We started it, the journey, I mean. Amazing. I thought we were going to be stuck on land forever, what with Brian coming up with new lists every day. That boy sure likes to make lists. So does his father. They're a real list-making team. Nothing is happening except that the boat is actually sailing and not leaking too much or tipping over. Yet. Juggling. Sophie. Later, we got our first juggling lesson from Cody. I thought he was a really good teacher because he started out very simply with just one thing to toss in the air. We were practicing with packets of pretzels. This is stupid, Brian said. Uncle Mo was on watch, but he turned around to mutter, Juggling? Jeez. Then Cody had us toss two pretzel packets in the air, one from each hand. That was easy, too. But when we added the third pretzel packet, we were all fumbling and clumsy. Pretzels were zinging over the side of the boat. It's all in the motion of your hands, Cody said. Just get in a rhythm. This is really stupid, Brian said. It might help your coordination, Cody said. What's wrong with my coordination? It got ugly after that, so we stopped the juggling lesson. Brian and Uncle Doc are going over the charts and trying to catch the weather forecast on the radio. Tomorrow we leave for Nova Scotia, a straight ocean sail that should take three or four days with no sight of land. No land! I can't imagine it. I can't think what it will be like to see nothing but ocean, ocean all around. This will be our first big shakedown, yep, Uncle Doc said. Uncle Stu tapped his fingers on the table. Weather forecast doesn't sound too good. Oh, what's a little weather, Uncle Mo said. Blah, blah, blah. Cody. Stupid day. Stupid Brian was blah, blah, blahing about points of sale, as if he knows everything there is to know about everything. He doesn't know how to juggle, <laughs> that's for sure. This morning, Brian said to me, You like Sophie better than me, don't you? I said, Yep. Well, it's the truth. Tomorrow, Sophie is going to tell the first of Bompy's stories. Now that ought to be interesting. Shakedown. Sophie. I'm not really sure what day it is anymore. These duty watches are warping my sense of time. For the first couple days, there were two of us on a watch. I was paired with Uncle Doc, and we were on for four hours at a time, off for eight, then on for four more. Four hours is a lot, especially when it's dark and every muscle in your body is tensed, listening, watching. Everyone else is asleep then, and you know it's only the two of you, Q. 
keeping them safe. Out here, there isn't day and night, and then a new day. Instead, there are degrees of light and dark, merging and changing. It's like one long stream of time unfolding in front of you, all around you. There isn't really a yesterday or day before, which is weird, because then what is tomorrow? And what is last week or last year? And if there is no yesterday or last year or ten years ago, then it must be all now, one huge, big, present thing. This makes me feel very strange, as if I could say, now I am four, and by saying so, I could be four again. But that can't be. Not really. Can it? We've been sailing up through the Gulf of Maine toward Grand Manan Island in the Bay of Fundy, just west of Nova Scotia. Uncle Doc calls the wind a capricious lady because it comes in fits and starts. Yesterday, I still have to use words like yesterday because I don't know how else to talk about things that happened before. When we had a spell of fog, Uncle Doc recited a poem about fog creeping along on little cat feet. And as soon as he said that, that's what I saw when I looked out into the gray mist. Hundreds of little cat feet tiptoeing along. Later, when the fog rolled along in deeper, darker clumps, I imagined great big tiger feet loping toward us. Soft, furry, graceful tiger feet. I had a mournful, lonely spell when I was on watch, peering through all that gray, and suddenly I didn't want to leave the shores of North America, to set off across the ocean to be so far from land. But I didn't have long to be mournful because the wind came up strong from the north, which meant we had to do a lot of tacking and healing. The waves were huge, six to eight feet, or at least I thought they were huge, but Uncle Stu called them baby waves. You getting scared, Sophie? Uncle Stu said. And it seemed as if he hoped I was scared. So I said, No, I'm not a bit scared. Not the least bit. I was scared, but I didn't want him to know it. Below deck, it was chaos. It was Cody's and my turn to cook lunch, and we had food sloshed all over the place. Mind the mizzen pot! Hoist the flibber gibbet! Cody shouted as the pot's hot contents went sloshing over the side. Cody, are you ever serious? I said. He tossed a clamshell right in the soup. Oh, brother, he said. Sooner or later, everybody asks me that. I guess it's a touchy subject. The wanderer has had a few problems on her shakedown, leaks in the aft cabin and water in the sump. We spend a lot of time crawling around looking for trouble and then trying to fix whatever's wrong. So far, we've been able to plug all the leaks. You don't feel too worried when you know you can get to land within an hour or two if you have to, or where there is enough boat traffic so that you can hail help easily. But once we set off from Nova Scotia, what will we do if we spring a major leak? I don't want to think about that. I'd rather think about the good omens Dolphins have visited us three times. They come in groups of four or five and swim alongside the boat. They usually come when we're sailing fast, whipping along. It's as if they're racing us. They play up in front of the bow, darting back and forth right below the water, only inches from the hull. They're the most graceful creatures I've ever seen, gliding through the water without any apparent effort and then arching at the surface and raising their fins and backs out of the water. Cody calls them darlings. Here, dolphin darlings, over here! I always feel a little sad when they finally swim away, and Cody calls, Bye-bye, dolphin darlings. Bye-bye. We've changed the shifts around in order to have three people on watch through the fog. Cody's on with us now. Right now, I'm bundled up in my foul-weather gear, watching the sun rise in front of us and the moon set at our stern. I'm tired and damp and desperately need a shower, but I am in heaven. I'm learning so much every day, and the more I learn, 
the more I realize how much more there is to know about sailing and water and navigation and weather. Today, Uncle Stu gave us a lesson in sextant readings. It's harder than I expected, and Uncle Stu and Brian keep scolding me and Cody, telling us we're not pulling our weight unless we learn how to do all this because their lives might depend on the two of us. You'd better hope your lives don't depend on me and Sophie, Cody joked. Uncle Stu got mad. Not everything is funny, Cody, and when you're in the middle of that ocean, you'll be praying that if anything happens, everybody on board this boat will be capable of saving your hide. You could at least do the same for us. Yeah, 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 I hear you, Cody said, as he went below deck. Even Uncle Doc seemed annoyed at Cody this time. I sure hope that boy gets serious about something, he said. I had a dream last night, or was it in the afternoon, or the morning, or the day before, about being adrift in the ocean with no food, and we were all languishing on deck with no energy to do anything, and the boat was tossing and heaving around, and then a seagull flew overhead and landed on the boom, and Brian said, Kill it! Kill it! It's now about two in the afternoon, and the sun has broken through the clouds, and we're about 36 miles from Grand Banan. We're hoping to get there before dark. It's my watch now, so I'd better get busy. Bumpy and the car. Cody. Got yelled at for not understanding all the navigation gobbledygook. Got yelled at for joking around too much. Got yelled at for breathing. Well, almost. Sophie told her first Bompy story today. It went something like this. When Bompy was a young man, he lived on a farm, and his family was very poor. They didn't even have a car or a truck. But one day they traded two mules for a car. The only thing was, no one knew how to drive it. Bompy had ridden in cars, though, and he didn't think it could be all that hard to drive one. So Bompy volunteered to go to town to pick up the car and drive it home. It was raining, raining, raining. You should hear Sophie tell a story. She really gets into it. You can almost feel the rain on your head when she tells it. You can feel it. You can smell it. It's really something. Anyway, Bumpy goes to pick up the car, and it's raining, raining, raining. He's driving home, and he gets to the place where he has to cross the creek. There's no bridge or anything. When they'd walked that way or ridden the mules, they'd always just waded across it. So Bompy drives the car into the creek, but the water is rushing, rushing so fast, it's like a big wall of water coming down at him, and Bompy is yelling, Hey, giddy up! But the car won't giddy up, and that wall of water turns the car over, and Bompy scrambles out and watches the new car float down the stream. When Bompy finally got home, he got a scolding from his father and an apple pie from his mother. Why'd she give him an apple pie? Brian asked Sophie. Because she was grateful that he was alive, that's why, Sophie said. So, how do you know this story anyway? Brian said. Hush up, Brian, Uncle Doc said. But Sophie said, because Bumpy told it to me. That's how I know it. You could tell Brian wanted to say something else, but he didn't. No one did. I was sitting there, thinking about Bompy getting out of that car and his mother giving him an apple pie. Today, Sophie and Uncle Doc each juggled three pretzel packets for a couple minutes. They were so excited. I felt pretty good myself. I'm a teacher.